I'm David Dodick. I'm a professor of neurology here at the Mayo Clinic, and I chair the American Migraine Foundation, and I'm delighted to uh, be with you this evening. I, um, I want to thank you uh, for joining me tonight, and I want to thank you really very much for being a part of this very important community. You and your fellow patients have been um, a source of great hope and inspiration and comfort and support and advice for each other. Uh, and we've received just so many positive comments from people for whom this community has become a home and a place for getting advice and, and getting support uh, from uh, patients, from other patients. So thank you very much for being a part of this community. Uh, we thought that in light of the recent approval last week of fremenezumab for migraine prevention, uh, that it would be timely to have a discussion tonight on uh, CGRP as a target for migraine in general and on the new therapies that have been approved over the last four months. And after that, I'd be uh, delighted uh, to take any questions that you might have, and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. So let's talk a little bit about CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide is a protein that's been known about for more than 30 years, and it was speculated as uh, probably being important in migraine about 30 years ago or so, when it was discovered in pain fibers that innervate um, structures in, in and around the brain that are pain sensitive. Um, it was also discovered that it was a potent vasodilator, and of course back then, we thought that migraine was a vascular headache and the pain was due to the distension or dilation of blood vessels. Um, and that's why, why it was thought to be important, but now it's still important, but for a different reason. And that reason is that we've discovered that it actually transmits pain signals along the trigeminal nerve, and those pain signals then enter the brainstem and ultimately um, up through the brain itself. So it's a, it's a sensory signaling protein or peptide that's important, we believe, in generating and in maintaining uh, the headache associated with migraine. Now, as you know, um, about four months ago in May, uh, the first monoclonal antibody was approved for migraine prevention. Uh, and just last week, the second monoclonal antibody, fremenezumab, was approved for migraine prevention. These are the first molecules or biologics that have been specifically designed to prevent migraine. Um, so since, since the dawn of time, we've never really had disease-specific mechanism-based preventive therapies for migraine until the advent of these monoclonal antibodies. And it's important to understand that monoclonal antibodies are biologics. They're not actually drugs. They're synthetic peptides or peptides that are engineered to, be, to specifically target and attack um, uh, a specific protein or its receptor, in this case CGRP uh, or its receptor. Because they're not drugs, and because they're proteins, they're actually broken down when they get into the body by enzymes into their own, into little proteins or into amino acids. So they're not actually metabolized by the liver, they're not excreted by the kidney, um, and they don't get past what we refer to as the blood-brain barrier. So they don't get into the brain um, in any appreciable quantities. And that's probably a good thing. They, work, they seem to work outside the brain. And because they're not metabolized by the liver, um, they, there's no drug-drug interactions. So regardless of what other medications a, a patient may be taking, uh, it doesn't compete um, for enzymes in the liver. It's also important that because they're not metabolized by the liver and they're not excreted by the kidney, that people who have um, kidney impairment or liver impairment could and should be able to take and tolerate uh, these medications. So that's, that's really uh, an important feature uh, of these biologics. Now, the one that was recently approved, uh, fremenezumab last week, or Ajovi, is now the second monoclonal antibodies, as we talked about, that was approved. And the approval of this antibody was based on uh, a number of studies, most importantly, two pivotal phase three trials in people who have episodic migraine and in people who have chronic migraine. And as many of you know, episodic migraine is defined as people who have migraine but less than 15 headache days per month, and those with chronic migraine have more than 15 days per month. These studies were referred to as the HALO studies. Just a couple of things about these studies. Um, both studies compared two different dose, dose regimens to, compared to placebo. The first dose regimen was um, 
225 milligrams delivered as a single dose once a month for three months. The second dose regimen was a single larger dose, three times the dose in fact, or 675 milligrams, delivered just once. And then in months two and three, uh, people got placebo injections. So 225 once a month was compared to 675 as a single injection, and both of those were compared to placebo. Now in the chronic migraine study, um, there's a lot of data, but just to summarize, the percentage of patients who got a 50% reduction in the mean average monthly number of headache days was 41% uh, in the monthly dose group and 38% in the single higher dose group. That's in the chronic migraine study. In the episodic migraine study, which had an identical design, the proportion of patients who had a better than 50% reduction in migraine days was about 48% in the single monthly dose group and 44% uh, in the higher, single higher dose group. So those are fairly robust um, responder rates uh, for migraine prevention trials, including the chronic migraine group, um, of whom um, a certain proportion, a significant proportion, were actually overusing acute medications by overusing and I don't like that term, but uh, they were using acute medicine more than 10 days per month. Importantly, the most common adverse reactions or side effects in these clinical trials um, was injection site reactions. So redness, swelling, itching around the injection site, um, slightly more than the, what, what was found in the placebo group. The adverse reactions that most commonly led to uh, discontinuation were also injection site reactions, though it should be said that the side effects that led to discontinuation from the study was only about 1% to 2% um, in the active treatment groups. Now, in the FDA's label for fremenezumab, there is a precaution uh, regarding hypersensitivity reaction uh, that included a rash or generalized itching um, or uh, hives. Um, and that we, they were reported in a, in a small minority of patients. Generally, the hypersensitivity reactions were mild to moderate, but some led to discontinuation or actually required treatment with steroid. Usually, they occurred within hours, but certainly they all occurred within one month uh, after the first injection. So that is a precaution that patients should be aware of. Some important considerations that have come out as analyses since those pivotal trials were completed is that 20% of the patients in these trials were on other drugs for prevention. And that's relevant because most of the patients certainly that we're going to be using these treatments on initially will likely be on other drugs for prevention. About one third were on topiramate or topamax and about 13 to 18% were on uh, botulinum toxin or, or Botox. I should also say that fremenezumab has now been shown to be effective in those who previously failed to respond to topiramate and Botox, um, and the one-year open-label data. So for those patients who continued on the medication for a year rather than just three months, showed that the effectiveness in patients who stayed on the drug uh, or the biologic was sustained, and the side effect profile appeared to be very similar to what was found in the first three months. So how does fremenezumab or AJOV differ from Amovig, which was approved back in May, and now over 100,000 patients in the United States have been treated with? Well, a couple of key fundamental differences. One is that fremenezumab uh, targets the protein itself, whereas Amovig or arenumab targets uh, CGRP's receptor. I tell patients it's kind of like a targeting the lock versus targeting the key. Fremenezumab targets the key so that the door to pain can't be opened, whereas um, arenumab targets or gums up the lock so you can't actually get the key in the lock to open the door. Um, so that's one way of thinking about it, and that's how these two differ. We don't know whether that means anything with respect to effectiveness or with respect to side effects, but what we can say from the clinical trials is that overall the effectiveness and the side effect profile appears to be very similar. We also don't know whether if you don't respond to one of these antibodies, 
let's say the receptor antibody, would you respond to the antibody that targets the protein or vice versa? We don't know the answer to that, um, but if history uh, tells us anything, it's that different drugs within the same class can have a different effect in an individual patient. So I'm cautiously optimistic that patients who fail to respond to one may respond uh, to another. One of the other differences is that for arendumab or amovig, um, the, drug, the biologics delivered as a monthly subcutaneous uh, injection. Uh, for fremenezumab or ajovi that was approved last week, um, it can be delivered either as a monthly subcutaneous injection, just like arendumab, or as a quarterly injection every three months. So the patient can deliver three injections actually at one time um, every three months rather than every month. So that, that is a difference as well. I think a practical difference is that arenumab comes as a pre-filled auto-injector, whereas uh, fremenezumab comes as a pre-filled syringe. Arenumab must be injected within seven days after it's unrefrigerated, because these, these biologics have to be refrigerated at 36 to 46 degrees, and when you take them out of the fridge, um, they have to, arenumab has to be injected within seven days, whereas fremenezumab has to be injected within 24 hours. I think another potential difference is that the hypersensitivity reactions um, that were uh, identified with fremenezumab weren't reported with, uh, with arenumab, whereas constipation, which was a side effect uh, with arenumab, uh, doesn't seem to be reported to any significant degree with fremenezumab. So the five side effect profiles might be slightly different uh, with these medications, but time will tell once we get more experience in clinical practice. So how are they similar? Well, they're both effective. They both appear to be very well tolerated and they both appear to be safe. There were no serious treatment-related adverse events or side effects that occurred um, in, in any of the trials actually with these two antibodies or with any of the antibodies, um, which, is, which is good for patients. Um, <clears throat> the treatment-related side effects that led to discontinuation in these antibody trials were 3% or less. Um, and that's really significant because compared to conventional migraine prevention drugs that are available and have been available for years or decades, the discontinuation rates could range from 8% all the way up to more than 30%. Um, and that's one of the problems we have with currently available treatments, is that if you look at a group of patients who start with an oral preventive drug for migraine prevention, more than 80% of them will have discontinued that drug by one year, and a large, uh, in, la in large part due to the side effects that patients ex experience on these medications. So the important thing about these antibodies are that because they're well tolerated by most patients, if they work in an individual patient, that patient's likely to be able to adhere to the drug, stay on the drug for a longer period of time, and as we've seen in these trials, the benefit grows over time if you're able to stay uh, on the medication. Some other similarities is that the long-term data thus far shows that the effectiveness appears to be sustained in those in whom it works and they stay on it, and the side effects look uh, fairly similar to what they look like in the in the placebo-controlled trials. There's now one-year open-label data, we call it, in people who are on fremenezumab that's been reported, and there's now three-year data in patients who have been receiving arenumab showing that the effectiveness is sustained and the tolerability is sustained in those who stay on it. A few more things I should mention is that um, these medications, both of them appear to be effective in patients who have failed previous preventive therapies. And that's important for a couple of reasons. Number one, most of the patients that are going to be eligible and who will be first in line to receive these medications have failed not only two, but usually many more uh, preventive treatments. Uh, and number three, uh, it's likely that insurance companies will require um, failure to a couple uh, or more preventive therapies before someone can get access to these treatments. So knowing that they're going to be effective in patients who have failed prior preventive therapies is something that's very important. Another point is that both appear to be effective in patients who, who use acute medications more than 10 days per month, particularly those who have chronic migraine where a large percentage of people 
overuse acute medications or use them more than 10 days per month. They both appear to be effective in patients who have episodic or chronic migraine. And something that I think is important to patients is that they have a relatively rapid onset of effect. So anywhere from three days to a week, um, these medications seem to separate from placebo in terms of the rapidity of response. Now, having, now that's a great thing, but having said that, even if patients get a partial response in the first month or the first two months, um, we would maintain those patients on the medication because there's no question, it seems, that the benefit grows over time. So if you notice in the first month or so that there's been a benefit, but it's not the kind of benefit that you would have hoped for, I think it's important to stick with it um, because like most other therapies that are effective initially, um, that benefit just continues to accumulate and grow and become enhanced over time. Now, I should say that there's limited information on the long-term safety of these medications. Um, as I said, there's three-year data now on over 400 patients who have been on arenimab, and there's one-year data uh, on a certain proportion of patients who have been on fremonezumab, um, but that's limited. Um, tens of thousands of patients have not been treated for years, so the, the safety profile um, uh, while seemingly very positive thus far, we'll have to await uh, a much, uh, much more clinical experience. Also, it should be said that there's minimal and, and, and quite frankly, insufficient evidence in women who are pregnant or lactating to know whether or not these biologics are safe. And that's important because many of the patients we treat, of course, with migraine um, are women of childbearing age. Um, so it's really important that in the past, while well, if a per, if a woman's on a medication um, and they want and that and, and she wants to start a family, we would take them off the medication, um, perhaps keep them off for a month or two, and then um, you know try to conceive. But here, um, one of the benefits, of course, of these biologics is that their half life is a month, which allows them to be administered once a month um, rather than taking a pill every day. The downside of that, of course, is that the biological effect of these treatments can stick around for five to six months. So for those women who are planning to conceive and start a family um, and become pregnant, you really have to be off these antibodies for five to six months. So that's very, something very important until we know uh, what the safety profile is of these, uh, of these medications in pregnant woman, women. Uh, it's important that if you're trying to conceive that you need to be off these biologics for five to six months.